And we are back. All right, first of all, a piece of uh, semi-old business. A number of you sentient cells of the group mind did exactly the right thing. You called up and said, hey, schmuck, he couldn't have gotten an award for uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. We're talking here about Nick Meyer, because it was in 82, it was the wrong year. You're right. So he must have got it, I figured out, for the day after. Well, guess what? That one didn't win any awards either. And then Mark Shepard, our, uh, our filmmaking person here, brought up an interesting point. Quoth Mr. Shepard, the George Powell Memorial Award was given only once. Yes, it was given to Nick Meyer for time after time, and this was a few years ago. Well, maybe because it was a time machine. Maybe. Right. He was given it then, but he only got it now. Hey, listen, if you can figure out Dr. Don, <laughs> you're a better man than I am, okay? <laughs> we'll talk about that afterwards, too. Yes. Uh, all right. Our guest tonight is a very special one, and I would like to ask our uh, sporadic co-host, Jim Van Heis, to introduce him. Jim? Okay, our guest tonight is Sid Mead, uh, a visual futurist and who uh, in the last few years has become known for designing uh, work in some uh, very well-known motion pictures, such as Star Trek the Motion Picture, Tron, but most notably of all, the film he's done the most work in, uh, Blade Runner. And a lot of his work from that film has been published in magazines like Cine Fantastique and Cinefix. And he designed The Spinner, which is making the rounds, supposedly. It, people, it's being rented out for commercials and things like that. Some of you may have his book, Sentinel, which came out in 1979 from Dragon's Dream, which is difficult to locate now, but much sought after. So, without further ado, Mr. Sid Mead. Bravo. In the, uh, in the Cinefix article, Sid, about Blade Runner, they quote you with saying that uh, when you design automobiles, you cannot just put a, an, a blank automobile on a page. It has to, it has to be in a lived-in scene. And I was noticing in that book that you have the, the, uh, the backgrounds and so forth. And that would seem to imply that beyond the frame of that, or beyond the car, you have got ideas for an entire civilization, a whole society in which that car and those people and those buildings and everything else operate. Do you? That, uh, that approach is a carryover, I suppose, of the way I was trained to design and think uh, regarding real cars. Because if you're going to design for a consumer market, you have to visualize the society that's going to use them, where they're going to be driven. Uh, cars are lower today because we have paved roads. Hmm. for instance. Uh, cars will probably always hold about four people. Uh, that means the cabin size stays the same and we shorten the trunks, lengthen the hoods, and you work around a kind of an idea format. But I don't like to do cars on blank paper because that's unnatural. I like to visualize the entire uh, surround, the scenery in which they'll be rolling along reflecting the trees and the sky hmm. and the buildings. Hmm. It makes it more exciting too. It, I saw a quote once from somebody at General Motors, and they talked about um, the difference between an engineer and a designer. And they said, uh, a designer designs this really terrific car, but where do you put the engine? And the engineer will design a car that looks like a tractor. Uh, <laughs> where, where, do you, where do you put yourself in, 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 in that sort of space? Well, the, the industrial design training process would hopefully help you appreciate the need for Number one, accommodating the engine, mm -hmm. unless you're doing a show car and the engine is a mysterious uh, motive source. <laughs> uh, once you start going beyond uh, 100 years from now, my guess is as good as anybody else's. Is there, is there room for engines in the Blade Runner cars? We invented a theoretical power source, which was a high-speed, high-density turbine complex, which would, uh, in effect, produce vertical lift through fan directions, mm -hmm. which uh, the principle is called aerodyne. And uh, I suggested to Ridley that we should avoid folding wings or propellers or whirling things that are coming out of the vehicle so that it could be recognizable as a character car mm -hmm. flying or rolling on the street. Mm -hmm. In that case, why call it a spinner? Uh, whoever wrote the script called it the spinner, and that's what it was all the way through. So they don't use internal combustion engines at all? I mean, even if they were to hard, work. Hard to get a hell of a lot of lift with it. I guess so. <laughs> was it a Ford heavy. spinner? Uh... Well, they invented the, the graphics 
the graphics program that Larry Paul ran through uh, with his design staff was ingenious because the the uh, the effect of the whole approach to the to the graphics and messing the cars up with uh, graffiti and and scrawled on legends and so forth uh, produced this sort of lived on the street look. Mm. I I couldn't have invented a better finished look. Uh, than they did simply because it was a uh, kind of a growth additive kind of thing. Um, I've asked this question of writers, but I guess I've never asked an artist this question. I've never asked somebody who worked on a project large enough to, ma to make a difference. Um, when you design an entire culture, which is pretty much what you've done with the Blade Runner thing, uh, do you, before you start drawing, do you, do you do a lot of thinking first? Do you do like an encyclopedia first, or do you kind of find out what the culture is like as you go along, and feed yourself ideas as you go along? Well, the, the Blade Runner culture, what we needed was a kind of a, a gate for things to go through to become real in this proposed world that we were mm -hmm. putting together. Ridley and Larry, pa Larry uh, Paul and Ivor Powell and I would have discussions, and we evolved this culture where the capital energy, if you will, was spending so much on off-world projects that the consumer base was neglected. In other words, things might have been new ten years ago and you didn't have a new car on the market. You had to make an old car work. That produced the retrofit look, which we called retro deco, <laughs> or trash chic. <laughs> uh, then we invented the how high were buildings and why were they that high. We predicted that if the trade towers are now, you know, 13, 1400 feet, the Sears Tower, uh, building is being proposed seriously for 2,000 feet. We raised the limit to about three, three and a half thousand feet, and that produces a basement, which in effect goes to about 60 floors above ground. And they and look sort of like Mayan temples, most some of them. That was part of the retro deco. Uh, we shoved Mayan, modern, deco, uh, a little bit of Baroque here and there, and Aztec, and just lumped it all together to yeah. get this strange, composited look. And a lot of Oriental stuff. That was thrown in. One reason, uh, if you've been to an Oriental urban area like Hong Kong or Tokyo, and you don't speak the language, you don't read the language, and the movie was intended for mainly English-speaking audiences, you get a very dense graphic look on the streets, neon signs and so forth, but it's not visually or idea distracting because you can't read it. Hmm. Do so you want to live the in best that city? Of both worlds. Excuse huh. me. Do you want to live in that city? No. This was an illustration of a story written by Philip K. Dick. Uh, the screenplay, I believe, was by Fancher and uh, Peoples. And it was an illustration of that particular future which Dick had written about. But can, can you design an urban scape such as that, and I don't know if that's a word or not, but, uh, and not put yourself into it and not have, have emotions about whether or not you like it and whether or not uh, you want to be there, and does that have an effect on the designs? I don't think so. I've worked on, for instance, for commercial clients, when I was working in, uh, for a company in Chicago, we did a very energetic, beautiful presentation series of books for both U.S. Steel and aluminum and a plastics company, all within 36 months. Hmm. But what you do is you separate the whys and the why nots, and once you have your, your map set up, in this case our culture gate for Blade Runner, uh, then you go ahead and you produce a very convincing composite uh, visualization. The, uh, a, lot of, a lot of oriental signs, and, and you already said, it gives it a dense graphic look without having to read it. Somebody did... <laughs> Were those, were those random oriental characters, or were those carefully chosen to mean something? That or? I don't know. Well, you don't know? I don't know. The, some of the preliminary tempera renderings that I had done for Ridley, uh, I just made up oriental-looking uh, ideograph characters. I uh -huh. had no idea what they were, uh, just so to get the look. So the stuff in the movie? Uh, made I'm it. assuming they did culture-based uh, research or had an advisor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would assume that. Was there any... My, my thought as I watched the movie was that there was all this oriental stuff, not just because, I mean, you ha were coming from a graphic point of view, but I was thinking also because we are in the West Coast and there is a large Asian community here in Los yes. Angeles. 
Um, and maybe we'll have a, even more of an influx of Vietnamese mm -hmm. uh, and the Japanese cars, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, things we would never would have guessed 20 years ago. Is there is there any of that in, in your choice of having such a large oriental look? Well, like? of course, the choice was Ridley's. Oh, it was? Right, being the director. Uh, that was his interpretive add-in. The, there's a phenomenon, cultural phenomenon now, which is just labeled the Pacific Rim, which is all the high-tech cultures around the uh, Pacific edge. Hmm. And uh, uh, plus the fact the Oriental uh, accent or the, the graphics and the, the population just made it more exotic. Certainly so. Did you and Ridley Scott see the concepts the same way, or did he... I understand that you conceive the spinner as being an elite vehicle because unlike other science fiction stories, you don't feel that it's logistical to have a whole stream of air cars, a multi-level existence like the Jetsons, say, which had that type of no. thing. It's a wonderful <coughs> fantasy, <coughs> excuse me, and it's a very enduring one because the flying car has been a popular idea since the 1900. Mm. Uh, and before with balloons and, and wonderful sails and all that business. But when you consider the failure rate of three-dimensional traffic streams dropping down through other traffic streams onto crowded traffic lanes at ground level, uh, you have chaos with even a, you know, point zero 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 nine failure rate. So I doubt if it'll happen unless we invent some kind of anti-gravity that can hold an object or get it offline until you can go. Maybe ahead. Robert Ford would recall and tell us all about it. In in um, in Blade Runner, there were as well as the very crowded spaces uh, and the, the noodle stands and, yes. and such. There were also a number of, of wide open spaces. I, re I remember, I guess it was uh, when when the girl meets the guy who creates the robot, the, the the droids for the droids. What am I saying? The androids, the, the replicants for the first time. She seems to be walking out of a, it, almost like a bombed out city she's walking, she's walking in from, and there's nobody around it. It seems very open. And here's this guy who's living in a place that looks like um, uh, a suite. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's decayed, and it's not quite up to what we think of now as being high class, but el it, the size of what you would think of is an enormous suite in a very fancy hotel. And he seemed to have this entire building to himself. That was Tyrell. No, no, not Tyrell. No, Sebastian. Was Sebastian it Sebastian? And the, the guy oh, with the, the toys. The, the, in the building where it looked like it was raining inside the building. Yeah, right. the guy yeah, with all the right. toys. Yeah. Well, the reason was that um, there were people that could not go off-world to the colonies mm -hmm. because they had genetic defects. And part of the character of Sebastian was that he had a genetic defect which was accelerated aging. It's, I don't know what the medical term for it, it it's, it's legitimate. Oh, that's what uh, Charles defect. Beaumont had. Um, well, I think that's different. You're thinking of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease, yeah. Is that something that else? affects uh, the brain. The, the, the other one he's talking about is one that prematurely affects the body. In the movie, oh, I think I Sebastian tells her that he's X number of years old and he looks like he's about 50, 55. You know, yeah. His skin is wrinkled and all that. So that's why the building was empty, because there was a lot of space in these older places. You know, because everybody might have been was a gone. logic hole in the plot, but that was the explanation for it. It's real interesting. It's real interesting. Do you know, I mean, th this is, uh, it wasn't part of the movie, so maybe it's not something you thought about, but <coughs> what were those colonies like, I wonder? I mean, no I mean, once you got there, I mean, here, <laughs> here it is, the government of the world. I, I don't know if it was a world government or, or just the U.S. government or whatever replaced the U.S. government. Yes. What it, do you have any idea about the government? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, no, we never went that far. Uh, if you'll recall, one of the, when they were scanning the replicants that had escaped, mm -hmm. uh, one of the girls was referred to as a, it was an issue, uh, incept date, such and such, mm -hmm. and she was your standard uh, club pleasure model. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one was a specialist in uh, uh, kick fighting and so forth. So they were, they were genetically made to be a certain kind of characteristic behavior. Mm -hmm. So you probably had entertainers, you had uh, representatives of the oldest profession in the world, you had uh, uh, load-carrying servants or, or grunts kind of thing. There was one of those too, wasn't there, yes. as I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Did you talk a lot with the, the person who uh, designed the clothes? No. 
Not at all. Not at, how, did, could, how could that be? I mean, everything well, seemed to fit. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, we invented this, this sort of a social structure gate. Mm -hmm. And then all the people that were working on the movie, you know, there was Doug Trumbull's crew uh, building the modelscapes, the, the, uh, uh, we called it Ridleyville, the plane where all the belching smoke and the fire was coming <laughs> up. Uh, you had the miniature building uh, modelers, the miniature vehicle modelers and the, clo the costuming. And of course, Ridley is the director and Laurie Paul is the art director, so you have this managed, you know, oh, I thought you were the art director. No. What was your title? Conceptual Futurist. Oh. So what did the other guy do? What did the art director do then? Well, the, the art director works with the director to interpret uh, budget limits and may build sets, run the uh, set building procedure, and make sure that the shots are built the right way. Mm -hmm. To use the image you used before, you would be the designer and he would be the art, uh, be the engineer. In in a way, yes, but he still has to have artistic. Uh, oh no, of judgment. course, yeah. sure. But okay. there has to be a sympathy at both ends of the uh, creative scale, yeah. and I'm not as a lifetime endeavor in the movie business. Uh, I'm in the design business, generating ideas. So I'm very comfortable working with somebody who's an expert in whatever field, cars, trucks, planes, uh, helicopters, whatever it happens to be. How many actual versions of the city were there? I mean, there was, of course, the full-size one that people walked around and you drove stuff through. Right. Uh, how, many, how many models were there and how many different scales of size? Uh, the miniatures that the spinner flew around, um, they were, I think, an inch, inch and, or an inch and a half to the foot. So they were quite large. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you had Ridleyville, which was the vast plain of belching smoke and fire. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that was a diorama about probably 15 feet on a side, something like that. And uh, then as you approached, and then when the movie opened, and you were approaching Tyrell's empire, the two pyramids, mm -hmm. the control buildings, the first time you see the buildings, there were actually transparencies, just oh. flat-lit transparencies. Huh. And then the eye blink, Deckard's eye was blinking as you went through the sequence. Mm -hmm. And really used the eye blink to change the, the set, the, the next cut for the uh, approach to the Tyrell Towers. Huh. You mentioned you did uh, a preliminary painting which was used to turn into the matte painting which was put at the end of the street that had the Bradbury building on it. Right. In here, in, in Cinefix number 9 on page 57, they show a progression of using that matte painting and the street and the live action. And interestingly, way in the background on that painting, there's a, a, a gigantic M. Uh, was that their <laughs> idea or yours? I don't know. We were after uh, um, working on Disney, and we came up with a term called Third Reich graphics, which are enormous, huge, you know, graphics just for scale, <laughs> outrageous scale. And uh, we just wanted giant characters, like 15, 20, 30 stories high on these enormous buildings. Somebody told me, who was it? It may have been Pat Miller altogether. Somebody told me <laughs> that, that in the background on some of these shots, or one of these shots, is the Millennium Falcon. Is that so? And if there, so, why is that so? <clears throat> there seems to be a built-in joke kind of thing to do on, on model miniatures. I don't know why. Um, and it could have very well been. Oh, you're not aware of this? I'm not aware of it, no. Oh. But okay. I know the model building people like to put little stuff into the models that they can point to when the film is rolling and they say, just to the right of that red spot there is, <laughs> guess what, you know, R2-D2 on the mothership or something like that. Yeah, I've, I've heard those stories too. <laughs> yeah, the interior of the mothership they did for the special edition of Close Encounters had all kinds of things like that. They had a shark chasing a skin diver and... Uh, they had an, an airplane <laughs> from 1941, one of the little miniatures in there, and <coughs> these were in angles that were never photographed. But the model makers would put them in just to relieve <coughs> the tedium of, of building something that's 10 feet tall and that they have to put <coughs> eight miles of fiber model optics in. Is and very tedious, yeah. having gone through recently the 2010 process, and those guys work 24 hours a day. I was told, I don't know if this is true because I'd never seen it, but I was told that on the um, the V'ger, not not the not the thing itself that they come to talk to, but yes. but but the huge rock thing that that, that they that right. they sail right. that opens up and that they go into. Right. Somewhere in there, as the Enterprise sails by on one of the rocks, 
<laughs> is written UNCLE. <laughs> Very, possible. Uh, Very possible. Uncle fans yeah. did this. And, and it could be it was the same crew who did that that did the interior of the mothership. Could be. Built in the same shop. Yeah. Well, the Star yeah, Trek V'ger model was 47 feet long. Oh, really? Yeah. So there was a lot of room to write the little stuff. So how big was the, the Enterprise? I mean, the Enterprise at that point uh, was very small relative to it. the size of a Coke bottle cap. Yeah, very small. Scale. Yeah. We built one, theoretically, the, the V'ger entity, uh, as I designed it working with uh, John and Robert Weiss, was supposed to be a, a hexagonal cross-section with a... 60 to 60 degree twist as it went from fore to aft. I don't know what that means. And <laughs> we were stuck with a hexagonal cross section because there was a professor of computer sciences who had designed this, this beautiful cam uh, maw opening for the front of V'ger. Mm -hmm. And essentially six uh, cones rotated with a cam surface cut off. And of course as they rotated, the, the hexagonal circle would open up and close. Very ingenious. So we were we had to use that because it had been designed and it was it worked perfectly. It looked like uh, it it was it was organic and mechanical at the same time, which I guess is what you were going for. We achieved the goal. I hope. Uh, yeah. Had you had you ever done any talking or studying of uh, the the H R Giger stuff from Alien, which was I'm also fascinated. mechanical and organic yes. at the same time? I'm fascinated with Giger's style and the way his head works, which is it's wonderfully it. strange. Uh, we did have to come up with that exact idea of layers of growth that had solidified, and maybe somewhere down underneath there was a whole new generation of stuff happening. And that was the mystery that Robert Wise wanted in that, uh, that model. Hmm. And, and, and there it was. As a visual futurist, how would you design the Olympics? The <sighs> That's a good question. <coughs> that is a, uh, that's timely. Um, here on Earth, I've done games in outer space using uh, the rotation effect of spheres and uh, freeway races inside of a 10 kilometer ball. Hmm. That's just such a, a startling question. I, I can't, uh, <laughs> can't think I'd go, how I'd go about it immediately. If you, if you had to design <clears throat> well, this is... Uh, uh, all right, it's an unfair question. I'm going to ask you an unfair question. <laughs> all right. Okay. This will be number two. This will be number two. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, because science fiction writers are forever saying that they're not really predicting the future. All they're doing is they're giving you a good time with what they think the future might look like or yada, yada. Anyway, yes. if you had to design a f what you really thought the future might look like, what might that look like? Could you describe that to well, I think eventually Earth is going to become, we're going to go out into space. Uh, I assume that because as a, as a whole human enterprise, we've got to. There's uh, no place else to we're, go. We're, we're here in, in what I'd call a closed loop. Once we leave the planet in sufficient numbers and can support our culture base in space, whether it's uh, just the nearby L5 locations or further out, I think Earth will be turned back to a park, just like it used to be. We can... We can regenerate. Uh, certainly, once that's we get a out long of way down the line. Yes, it is. Yeah. But if we stay here exclusively, I was amused when the uh, moon landings were first uh, on television publicized, and there was a, a hue and cry about spending all this money to go there. But the spin-offs in terms of uh, health care, uh, satellite communications, satellite observation, uh, crop rotation, uh, seeing pests in forests uh, long before the uh, damage is, is visible, uh, the benefits have been enormous, mm -hmm. uh, far beyond what the original cost was. I think that's what space people have been saying for years, and yes. nobody listens. But it's hard to confront, you know, unpleasant things like hunger, disease, and, and mm -hmm. uh, just sheer desperate want, too. Yeah. But I think we have to give ourselves the elbow room to have somebody somewhere in the luxury position of doing inventive things just for that purpose alone on the best chance, that, uh, best chance hope that you're going to come up with an answer. It's, it's mm -hmm. practically the only insurance we've got. That's for sure. Well, we also have to say that uh, our insurance requires us to say this is KPFK Los Angeles. <laughs> you're listening to Hour 25, Science Fiction, Science Fact, Science Speculation. Our guest tonight is Mr. Sid Mead, and he was a 
conceptual futurist, among other things, for uh, Blade Runner. As you heard, he designed uh, part of the V'gers, uh, which we all saw in the first Star Trek film. And with us also is Jim Van Heis, who's responsible for Sid Mead being here. And thank you, Jim, by the way, in case I didn't mention that. And also, of course, there's the, uh, the usual gang of idiots, Mel Gilbert. <laughs> what, me worry? And uh, I'm Mike Hodel. In, Go ahead. In, in, the, uh, in the book that James bought, brought with him, what is it called, Sentinel? Sentinel, yes. Sentinel. Uh, there are a lot of shiny, kind of spaceshipy looking cars. Uh, uh, that was the marvelous 50s and 60s. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the, yeah, and this is what the 80s would look like? Is, is that what you're going for? Well, you must remember, show cars were supposed to show people what they thought cars would look like, what, 10 years hence, yes. whatever the time span was. And you're always, I'm afraid, a victim of your own in-head memory. Yeah. And once you go beyond the public's ability to comprehend what it is you're trying to say, you lose, your, you lose their attention, pure mm -hmm. and simple. I guess the question that I w that I was yeah I bet that's true you lose because if it looks too strange they say they, they, then they can't relate to it. There's no category. Yeah. To fit it because in. you look at the Enterprise, especially the TV show Enterprise. Yes. And you look at it now, and as as, as much of a Star Trek fan as I am, you look at it now, and even taking into account that they were working with a real budget, right. it looks like a '60s mm -hmm. spaceship, and I'm sure that by the time we get to the year 2000. When we you'll, you'll see a Star Trek episode, you'll be embarrassed by all those buttons and the flashing lights because it's a it's it's a very pre uh, micro miniaturization kind of kind of place. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Has has Detroit ever come to you, or you ever gone to Detroit to see if you could design a, a real automobile? Well, I uh, was asked to go to Sweden for a Volvo for two weeks, um, uh, working on their mid eighties sports uh, vehicles. Yeah. Anything come of that? Um, what I was asked to do essentially was to submit an offline, which meant a non-contaminated by Volvo's design natural drift, mm -hmm. uh, an offline idea series, mainly as a check to see whether they were going in the right direction. They'd have another opinion. The right direction? Well, another opinion of someone who was involved in automobiles and had a grasp of the marketing problems and, and what people like, mm -hmm. and uh, just to see what I'd come up with mm -hmm. as an isolated case compared to what they were coming up with. I came up with something quite different from the design director, and uh, understandably he was interested in pushing his own idea, mm -hmm. and so of course they didn't use mine, mm -hmm. but uh, that's, that's strictly the claim. How come the them. cars we have now don't look as interesting as the ones that were designed 20 years ago as <laughs> the, the cars well, we would have now. <coughs> the cars we have now, a lot of them look awful dull and awful lot of light. They look like they, Japanese cars. They now. certainly <coughs> do. Uh, it's sort of a BMW Audi clone look. The, the problem is, I think, that the, in the 50s and 60s, the technology was being used as a, almost as a plaything. We could make cars and still can so easily that you can afford to treat them as fashion objects. We had lots of gas, cheap. Uh, you could move two tons of steel down the road to go shopping. Uh, it didn't cost you very much. Uh, fuel costs went up. We have an influence from the mass transit consciousness, uh, moving cabinets, that kind of shape input. Uh, the cars have gotten smaller. And when you make something smaller and still try to keep the inside the same size, you start to get a stretch around the points where you can't move and that's what ha that's what's happened oh. the, the Chrysler series of cars are very stylish very nicely trimmed but they're very vertical and the corners are very square hmm. my favorite car lately I don't know who's this gonna turn into the car show maybe <laughs> uh, is is the new is, is the uh, I guess it's the 83 Camaro that which, is the which, most beautiful body shell currently being made, I think. Yeah, I just went crazy yes. when I saw that. It's, a, it's, than a, the it's a rocket ship for the street. Yeah. Thankfully, somebody's thing. gotten back to making them. And now we'll go to... Well, the, there was all that reaction to the fins, though. I mean, when did... F the, uh, the fins got bigger and bigger and bigger. When was the maximum fin year, I wonder, late 70, 60s uh, sometime? Uh, 69. Cadillac. 69. Had the, those in 59. And Don't 10 not years 59. off. 59 Cadillac. Had fins almost as high as the roof of the car. Really? Yes. 
And maybe that's where the spaceship idea went away. It went away with the fins. Uh, it was the maximum fin on any car. When you sat in the back seat of the Cadillac Coupe de Ville in 59 and sort of turned around and looked aft and saw these two trailing blades with a little <laughs> flashlight taillight. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was a marvelous illusion. Of oh, just great. A marvelous solution. Of being sort in of a wash in, in on a highway, Chrome. no no traffic, you know, yeah. all by yourself. It was it was a rocket ship. I remember Billy Pilgrim in in uh, Slaughterhouse Five, getting into his Cadillac and driving it and saying it was like sitting in the middle of a wad of bubble gum. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Yeah. What, what interested me about your book Sentinel is not the cars so much as although they are fascinating, as the animals. The animals are little throwaway things. There's one yes. thing there of a creature that looks like it's a genetically engineered tiger uh, with something else. I'm not quite sure what. Um, it's part of that lived-in future. That strange that. white yes. cat with the yes. stripes. But I've large, always been know. fascinated with with the the mechanical organic crossover in animals and people, for that matter, because we we share the same skeleton parts. Uh, it's an ingenious mechanical system. Uh, when you think what nature's had to do with very, very poor building materials. And I just like to play with the proportions, make uh, three-legged jumping animals or uh, distort necks or push push uh, an alligator head onto a horse body mm. and just there. play with the genetic theories like that. There's an artist in Southern California, a lady named Pat Ortega. Do you happen to be familiar with her work? No, I'm sorry, I'm not. She does incredible anatomy and musculature, mm -hmm. and uh, you really should see it, I think. She just had some excellent work published in Epic a couple issues ago. Oh, at last, something Good. published, huh? Yeah. Good. A nice mm. portfolio. Good. I'm waiting for her to do covers. I've always done weird animals as pets or, or made a, a centerpiece in a rendering with a weird kind of a horse or, yeah. or a, a thing, just because it's entertaining. And uh, it adds to the weirdness of the scene. And if people are standing around treating these invented creations as sort of normal, they're not scared, frightened. It just heightens the awareness of looking through a little window into a mm. uh, theoretical future, an impossible place to be. You say you haven't made that many films. You mentioned where you've worked on Star Trek, on Tron, and on Blade Runner, a couple of others possibly. Do you want to make a film? Would you like to? From talking to the various directors I've worked with, it's a mind-boggling job. You gear up for this little gate that you have to run this whole thing through in about 30 to 60 days if you're lucky, and then you spend another eight months or nine months having people cut bits and pieces of it apart, put it all back together, and the music and the sound. Um, I think I'd be I'm more useful to myself to pursue what I'm doing now, which is doing this and that, car design, plane interiors, helicopters, the cruise ships, yachts, uh, consulting on the visual look of movie hardware and things like that. And I think I can bring, bring to each of those areas a broader view if I don't stick with any one of them. Uh, this is just out of nowhere. I, I, All right. I, okay. <laughs> um, I understand, and th this has been published, so this is not giving away any big secrets that, uh, for, from, from Paramount. I understand that at the end of Star Trek III, they're going to blow up the Enterprise. That's what I've heard. Mm. Have you anything to do with the design of perhaps a new starship? No. No, nothing to do with that. Okay. Not for Paramount. Not for, oh, somebody else you have to, uh, who are you designing starships for? Well, I don't know if it's a starship, really. It isn't that, uh, it isn't that kind of approach to it. And I, I won't tell you what the approach is, but <laughs> if you'd seen the pre-release art for 2010, which MGM is in Not a production thing. on. Have you it seen it? It was published in Variety and uh, the Holiday uh, Yeah, it was a, a painting that basically had elements from 2001 and the front small front portion of, uh, of the Leonov. Of the Leonov. Oh, what does that look like? Uh, you can really can't tell. It's just a small piece of it. just gives you a... I was very wondering deliberate. what the rest of it looks no, like. No, I'm sure. I mean, it's very yeah. deliberate. We moved the <coughs> drawing in and out of the, the rendering composition, and Peter Heim said, I think that's about enough. How many drawings are you doing for 2010 in comparison to what you did on Blade Runner? About the same if you subtract the gouache, uh, the tempera sketches. I've only done, as a matter of fact, the one uh, pre-release poster for 2010 as mm. a gouache uh, exercise so far. Do your cars from the Sentinel work? No. They were mostly done for promotional purposes for U.S. Steel, in this case. Uh, 
uh, most of the ones in the book. Uh, some of the advertising illustration cars were done just to romanticize a material, maybe like plastic, or romanticize the tires on the car. Tires? I did an ad series for Yokohama Tire, hmm. which I had to invent glamorous coupes, trucks, and cars. It would show off the tires. It would show off the tire. How would you do that? I mean, that, that seems... You read in the book. You invent a vehicle that looks... Uh, who uses the word just ahead of, of our time? Is it Panasonic? Uh, you invent a look that is just far enough away to look like it still needs tires, but has... Uh, it's just a standard thing to do with cars. You try to suggest the next level of technology that's going to be available, huh. either in motive power or uh, wonderfulness in terms of lighting, and you sort of make that work today, and you get that, that wonderful, glossy future look, but you can actually go out and buy it, and that's what you try to achieve. Yeah, that Camaro. I, <laughs> I keep thinking about that. Yeah, that's a, a very car. sensitive car. Yeah. Very sensitive car. Sensitive car. What does that mean to you? Just the way the curves are, are they're, they're tight. The, the top crown line of the fender, for instance, is just tight enough to be arched, but in certain angles, the highlight line, the reflection line, straightens out. You get this stretch from front to back. Oh, and this is all stuff and that it's people who design this stuff just barely curved, but it's still curved. It's not straight. And you try to get that, that tension so that the metal looks like it's, uh, it's being just bent and held that way. Huh. Do you think the designs that we are seeing now, the ones that will be workable in two years, five years, ten years, are they, are they good designs? Are they the right designs? Or is it sort of a blind alley from which we're going <laughs> to go ahead and, you know, next decade or two or five to something else? In other words, are we pretty much on the level, is there going to be some sort of, uh, granted you can't prognosticate that much, but is there going to be something that's going to change the way a designer looks at something and which will in turn change the way we all see it? Yes. The uh, solid state electronics <clears throat> is already changing products. For instance, dishwashers, refrigerators. Uh, you can talk to these machines, interact with a, with a touch plate. Uh, the next step is to make the touch plate change per use. They already do that with uh, some control devices. In other words, the, the, the touch plate, the, the key button or the keyboard, is a series of little miniature like a screen. So maybe the letters in, in the top row are all numbers under one mode of use. You change a selector and those that row of numbers or that row of buttons now becomes a row of characters or special hmm. symbols or something. And theoretically you can control everything in your house by a very small panel because the panel would change the command symbols. Hmm. And it's changing uh, products because we're getting less and less knobs, more and more flat plane, uh, plates, you can clean them easily. Uh, the product designers are having to get used to being graphic designers because all that's left is the control plate. You still have the box in the case of a dishwasher, but that can be underneath the counter or some other place. But there's only so small. I mean, you, you look at the human hand is a certain size and, right. and there's no way that you can miniaturize that. And so you look at a pocket calculator, which is, I mean, you've got a, you've got a cigarette box here, and yes. I don't suppose that no matter what you, you can do, no matter how miniaturized you can make a thing, you really wouldn't want to make a pocket calculator much smaller than this cigarette box. <laughs> well, I have a watch calculator, and what they've done is figured out center of pressure on your fingers, and the little buttons are, are hooked together in the circuit so that you can actually press one little tiny, tiny little button and not activate the one next to it, and the circuit knows by pressure which one is is being pushed. Huh. Well, but even even there, there's a limit. But it's 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 nonsense to use. Uh, you have to do it with the tip of a ballpoint pen, really. Yeah. It's just it's a gimmick. It's a wonderful little technological toy gimmick. Okay. What well, I guess the question the question uh, Go ahead. just just to finish this up a little bit. Um, in other words, the, we are rapidly approaching our limits as far as how small we can make things, electronic things. Not really. No? Well, they're, they're working on a protein computer. If they're successful, and what they're trying to do is grow protein molecules in ordered paths. Mm -hmm. So now you're down at the molecular le level, which is magnitudes of density greater in terms of memory storage. If they're successful, you could theoretically store the entire recorded history of mankind in a one centimeter square cube. Okay, so you've got that. 
But the box that you have to put that in has to be of a certain size. To protect it, it might have to be cryogenic. So then you have to wrap it with maybe a, a 10 pound jacket of some kind to keep it cold. For a while, but then that 10 pound <laughs> jacket becomes a five pound jacket, becomes a yes. one pound jacket, yes. and then it gets smaller and lighter. What, what we're probably going toward, the uh, Isaac Asimov, uh, the reason I love his stuff is that he, he has this progressive uh, sort of self-canceling logic progressions that he sets up. Um, and his point was that technology becomes uh, much larger and much smaller is just a predictable trend, mm -hmm. which means we can start building our own worlds at the same time we're making protein computers or, or sub-molecular sized things. And although there are limits, of course, in each direction, uh, that's the trend, and technology eventually becomes invisible. If you had the Library of Congress implanted in your head mm -hmm. and could access it any time you wanted, uh, and suddenly went back to the Middle Ages, you'd be an absolute astounding genius because they wouldn't know where you were getting all this accurate information. And they'd probably burn you. They would burn you in a minute. Yeah, just like that. Sure. Or however long it takes to burn, <laughs> a, person. <laughs> burn a person. Yeah. <laughs> right. let, let me ask you, what is the thing in your life that most frustrates you that you would like to redesign? Uh, right now, my uh, uh, word processor uh, computer setup uh, thoroughly frustrating because I don't know really how it works. Well, but, uh, but the more, more complicated that, I mean, protein. <laughs> when your car stops on Sunset Boulevard, that can be very irritating. You want to smash it, but you need it tomorrow for a meeting, so yeah. you get it fixed. So uh, there's, there's not something you would just say, the hell with this, I'm going to, do, I'm going to design this properly. So, so it doesn't stop on Sunset Boulevard, or I can... No. I think I'm frustrated mostly with, with attitudes of people that really don't believe that we can all work together and make things work. 